This next presentation is um, uh, brought to you from uh, two SANS instructors and authors, uh, Jason Dealey and Jeff Shear. First, uh, Jason Dealey will be presenting on a couple of different uh, attack approaches within industrial control system environments that we've sort of labeled the ghost in the network. And then we will transition to Jeff Shear uh, when we move into the ghost in the machine. Um, I know uh, our Viviana Ross from SANS has been putting out some fun facts in the, in the, uh, the Twitter posts, but uh, one piece specific to this presentation. So very early on when this idea for this conference got uh, created and we started working down the path of a CTF, Jason Dealey and Jeff Shear were both uh, deeply involved in authoring questions and generating artifacts for level one and level two of, those, uh, of the CTF for those who participated. Jason has been involved in preparing this presentation and getting everything ready. However, a uh, course, um, a SANS course, ICS 515, was put on schedule and um, Jason was assigned to teach that course. So he is currently teaching. And uh, as I understand the 515 course that Rob M. Lee um, wrote, those, uh, those students were actively participating in CTF as soon as class ended yesterday. I know today is challenge day for them, so a number of them are watching. And uh, to avoid any confusion, uh, Jason took the time after class uh, this week to record his portion of this demo. So we are gonna try another first for SANS. We are gonna show uh, a couple of minutes of Jason setting up his, uh, his demo via, via video, and then he will conduct the demo via video. Um, hopefully that all works. If it doesn't, we will simply have to skip it and move on to uh, Jeff's component. So uh, without any other further delays, I'm going to turn off my mic. I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn off my, uh, my video and then I'm gonna move into Jason's presentation. One other item for uh, Jason, other than a SANS instructor and a SANS author of uh, ICS 612, he teaches 515 and 612. He's been in this industry for uh, over 20 years. He is now a member of the SANS ICS team. Um, his bio on the page here indicates uh, his last role at Silance. His uh, previous role prior to that was with Rockwell as a system integrator for a number of years. Um, with that, I will stop my video and hope, uh, hope this, this test works. Hi everybody, this is Jason Dealey. Jeff Shearer and myself would like to take you through an interesting journey talking about ghosts in the network versus ghosts in the machine. Now what do we refer to as ghosts? When we design these systems, there is a lot of complexities, integrations, and design decisions that are put into this stuff. And sometimes anomalies can appear to be just that. However, if we abuse the way these systems are integrated, we could potentially produce attacks that can look like normal control system anomalies and less like the attacks themselves. So what I mean by that is we can essentially bring in some very interesting methods as far as how we can hide or influence the actions of these systems by using the design capabilities that were brought in during the engineering of these environments. So I'm going to start with ghosts in the networks. And with that, we're going to begin with control loops and talk about what a control loop is and the, and the physical processes that they operate. We will then jump into a demo about control loops. We'll talk about safeguards. We'll talk about in engineering and integration coding and deployment using common approaches that are performed on these systems. We will also talk about how we can abuse design use cases and use them in such a way that they were not considered during the integration. We will then talk about sanitized inputs. We'll talk about how PIDs relate to the real world and how we can abuse those sensitivities. And then ultimately, in, in the end, we will talk about some of the network monitoring that can be applied specifically to this type of attack. To start, let's talk about what a control loop is. Well, if we look at your car and speed control of your car, you essentially um, have a control loop. We call it cruise control. Cruise control is set by a desired speed through the function on the steering wheel. And ultimately, that set speed is then controlled by the car 
or by the loop controller inside, measuring the feedback of the rotation speed of the tires and using that to decide whether the engine needs to speed up or slow down. So if we go back, where this began is essentially in a mechanical measures through a speed governor, as shown in the display. Same principle. We have a rotating shaft. In this case, it's a horizontal shaft directly off the steam engine. As it rotates, it spins a weight at the top. In this case, it's a couple of weighted balls. It spins those weight in its through kinetic energy and the rotation speed that causes those balls to increase in height or decrease. As those balls increase in height, they push down on the valve, which controls this control fluid, in this case steam, supply into the speed engine. So essentially, the rotation speed will self-govern the amount of control fluid or steam entering into the steam engine. As far as how the operator sets the desired speed is through what's called a speeder spring. So they, either through compression or release, the operator is able to set what that desired speed and the mechanical mechanism is self-governing. In your car, on the other hand, you have what's called a PID controller, which takes um, the speed, or in this case, as shown in the diagram, is a float of the system itself, whether it's the process flow of liquid through a pipe, and is able to compare that flow of the process value, that we call it, and compare it to the set point, which is set by an operator. And the difference between those two um, set point and process variables the PID controller is able to adjust the control valve through electrical signaling and identify or be able to control whether the flow increases or the flow decreases to bring it to the desired set point. Of course, as systems become more complex, so do the PID loops that are used to operate them. So we may have a very tight system that has a required response time because if we are too hesitant in our delay of bringing it to the appropriate temperature, let's say, it could cause a quality problem with the product. So we must tune the loop using the physical properties as how it was designed, the system's designed, in order to come up with the appropriate response curve and to avoid overshooting and oscillation of the system itself. Tuning may not be a hard science, but it's also not magic. There is an algorithm that is used, which uses proportional gain, integral gain, and derivative gain as the constants that are used to tune the system. We're not going to get into the details of that, but instead what we're going to do is we'll jump into a demo and we will walk through this together and show you how this could be abused. To get started with the demo, let's first log into the local HMI. The local HMI has a VNC server, so we can easily log into it um, through VNC Viewer. This will be a lot easier to demonstrate than trying to bring a camera to the actual physical box. To start, let's first look at the objects around the display and get familiar with what we're looking at. So we have a line ID. In this case, it's ML42. We have the maximum allowable operating pressure. Uh, value that is uh, depicted during the design of the mechanical system. In this case, it's 1600 PSI. We have a set point button for the operations in order to set a desired pressure for the system. We have the process variable. In this case, it's you see it fluctuating around between 808 and 809. And that's coming from a pressure transducer 1101. So it's a label associated to a specific transducer in the line. We also have a control valve. In this case, it's CV1. The control valve right now is running in auto mode, so it is controlled directly by the PID loop. We have in a manual mode option, so we can adjust the percentage of the control valve. And on the right hand side, we have two trends. The top trend is showing a yellow marker and a green marker. The yellow is the set point, and the green is the process variable. And in the graph directly below it is the graph associated to the control valve. So to begin with the first attack, let's first understand what the normal operation would be. 
So an operator would be able to open the set point window and select a set point that they desire the system to operate at. Right now it's set for 800, so they can put in a new value and hit enter. We can also see that in this window, we have a value of between zero and 1500. Notice that the 1500 is well below the 1600 PSI. So what happens if we try to add in a value of 1600? Well, because of the operation of the HMI, we are denied. We are not allowed. It's a hard set value on the HMI software developed by the engineer to prevent an operations from incidentally or accidentally going beyond a preferred value or a preferred amount. So we can only put a value in that it makes sense as desired by the controls engineer. So we'll just put one in. Next, we have the manual mode button. And in the manual mode button, we can see that we have an ability to take it out of auto, which in this case immediately stops the operation of the PID loop controlling the control valve. Before we saw a nice smooth curve that was going down, coming from the control valve, which is now been disabled simply because we are putting the control valve in manual mode, meaning we are overriding whatever output is provided by the PID loop. From there, we can then set the percentage manually to what we desire, how much percent open we want the control valve. In this case, we set 50. Once we are complete with whatever reason we put it in manual mode for, we can then put it back into auto mode, which immediately will go back to the set point and allow, um, sorry, back to the PID loop to allow operation of this control valve. This may be a function that's used in diagnosing a system. It could be a function that's used during startup, testing of the operation of the control valve, and so forth. It's not something that's generally used. However, there are maintenance purposes um, and there's use cases that make sense. That's why they have this. However, when they choose to use a control valve in manual mode versus letting it run in auto, there's certain conditions that have to apply. So it's not something that can be used with, uh, or should not be used with just arbitrarily, you know, adjusting things. So what if we were able to bypass the HMI and directly write into the set point value. So in this first attack, we're going to just put a set point value to the tag and say, you know what, I want you to go to 1900 PSI. Well, the controller, the PLC is receiving that value. It does not have any means of sanitizing inputs. So it doesn't have the same blockage that the HMI has to prevent the tag from being set higher than 1600. Again, that's because the set point value in the HMI button is controlled by the HMI. It's not controlled by the PLC. So you could potentially put logic in the PLC that could sanitize those inputs. However, that is something that has to happen after in, in certain scenarios, and it's an extra function that needs to be performed during the engineering and deployment of these systems. In this next example, we were talking about this control valve. What if we were to bypass the HMI in this case and go through the various steps to set the control valve? As we saw when we were functioning it, we had to disable auto mode by putting in manual mode. We had to then open up the window, the numeric entry window and provide a value associated to the control valve position we wanted it to be, hit enter, which in turn send those tags down to the controller. So there's actually two tags that get sent to the controller in this situation. There's the percentage open, the manual amount that you want. There's also the manual and auto mode is also another tag sent to the controller. So if we wanted to automate this through another bypass attack, we would essentially need to just directly write uh, values to the controller and manipulate the same actions that we took. So in this situation, we're setting it to manual. So we're setting that tag. And we're also setting the tag to the percentage we want the control valve to be opened by. So we can just cancel out of that and let the system recover back to where it is. So in this last one is a little more trickier. Um, those previous attacks, they're essentially just using or abusing the fact that, you know, we intend, as we design these systems, we intend our operators to interact with the system through the HMI display that we've provided. We don't really expect people to 
uh, bring in their own Python scripts and start operating them on the system. When you think of this from a forward-thinking engineering standpoint, it's looking at it from we have a level of trust in how the users are going to use the system that they're going to use the tools given to them. So it does leave ourselves exposed that, you know, attacks coming off the network at a local level could potentially directly in, in, interact with the same tags by bypassing also the permissives that were given in through the HMI. Those same uh, permissives or allowances and restrictions are not necessarily programmed in the controller. There might be other mechanical methods that prevent some of these actions from happening. However, the point being is that um, we have to recognize that as a controller sitting on a network with a number of tags inside of it, potentially all those tags are available to whatever software or service is running on that network to interacting with it. So in this last situation, if we look at how the PID works and in the same kind of function. So what we have here is a PID loop, PID loop instruction. And um, we've said, you know, it's got a, the process variable is a tag, right? The control variable is also a tag. So that's the variable going to the actual uh, control valve, right? Inside the settings of the PID loop, we have a proportional gain setting. We also have the integral gain and the derivative time. So these are those values, those constant values that go into the math equation to determine what the appropriate control valve uh, operation should be to bring the system to the desired set point. So even though in this window, it doesn't look like these things are tags, they are actually tags. This entire instruction and all the variables inside of it are tags on the system. So what that means is that if we don't um, consider these things when we engineer, potentially we, we expose ourselves such that somebody may be able to interact with those tags remotely off of the network. So in this next situation, we are going to just arbitrarily throw in a value uh, into the process pro proportional gain. And what that does is it puts essentially the system into an oscillation whereby it's a little extreme in the situation because I don't have the physical system behind it of running off simulation. So, but the extremities are not too far off as far as what's happening in the system is it's continually oscillating, trying to find the stabilization of that set point. You can see where the script stopped and immediately everything recovered. But if I let that go on for a continuous point in time, there is only so much duty cycle that a control valve can operate under, in which case, it could have sat there and continued to op oscillate. If I blinded the operator through some man in the middle attack, the system could essentially uh, cause the control valve to fail. If you set that to a operator pressing pressure value that's undesirable at the same time, and you followed that up with breaking the connection to the controller, you've essentially set the system into itself break the control valve, physically cause problems, issues to the product, amongst other things, and lose remote visibility as well as local visibility of what's happening. So as you can see, it's, it's not um, a desirable outcome in the end. So how do we, you know, what should we be doing to look for, you know, ghosts on the network? It's not too much different than what we already know, which is we really want to bring in network level monitoring. We really un understand you know, fundamentally, the first thing we need to understand is what is allowed to talk to what. In this case, we can see that we have two IP addresses communicating SIP to the same device. So if the dot 10 is the PLC, we have a dot 30 and a dot 90 communicating. If we did a baseline earlier, we would have found that only dot 30 was actually communicating to the PLC, dot 30 being the HMI. However, in this situation, if we you know, came back and looked at it compared to baseline, we would have found that not only was dot 90 a new device communicating to it, but also in this situation, it's using a different protocol or a different part of the protocol in order to communicate. That would have stood out um, also by itself and been really um, concerning. Now there's other situations where if I was to view some of these pathways, um, I could potentially hide 
those values within the same type of traffic, if I was able to get control of the HMI and arbitrarily change the values of how the HMI operates, essentially it would still look like normal traffic from a network level. It would have looked like the HMI was talking to the PLC and it would look like those communications were happening over set. So the point being is network monitoring will definitely raise the bar, but sometimes just looking at the um, source and destination and the protocols in use may not be enough to actually uh, definitively understand what's happening in the environment. So as you get smarter and you're doing network security monitoring in these environments, also understand the adversary is going to have to work harder. So you have to uh, prepare yourself for a deeper analysis on what's happening and what's normal and not normal inside these environments. So with that, I'll pass it over to Jeff. Thank you. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for spending their most, most valuable resource with us, and that is your time. I know it's been said before, but um, I know you, everyone has a lot of things they could be doing and sitting here with us and learning about uh, industrial control system security is quite important, but um, again, I wanted to thank you. So we've got a picture up here, and when Tim and Jason and myself actually started talking about this particular demo and this particular talk, Jason and I were kind of off in the corner and we said, you know, when we get into lines or machine behavior, a lot of times there's so many strange things happening that it's hard to baseline quirky. And uh, I will give you a particular quirky baselining. I have uh, one car in my family that is a, about a 2016. And what I end up doing is because I live near Phoenix, it's hot. I push the remote start button and I let the car cool down. And I go out there and I unlock the door. I sit down and my phone will not attach. And so my standard operating procedure of quirky is I turn the car off, I open up the car door, it drops the uh, power to the radio, I close the door, I start the car back up, and my, my phone will attach. And so we deal with quirkiness, whether it's in your car or your air conditioning unit or whatever. And so when you get into these kinds of machines, there is just a lot of quirkiness and it is hard to actually baseline quirky. So why I'm telling you this is that when you have an event um, such as what happened popularly in Stuxnet, you might wonder why wasn't the owner of that equipment doing something about the first one that failed. And if you run around a factory long enough or do any kind of integration work, you realize that you're never done with product development and you're never done changing the program or making something better. And so with that said, Quirky lives in all these machines. Second thing is, is that every machine is like a individual in so much as that I was involved with a program where we built 16 machines for IBM and every 16 of them had the same bill of material and every 16 of them ran differently. So just like snowflakes, just like people, machines are actually quite different. Second thing is, I'm not going to assume that we are all familiar with how planned environments work. So, and why I say this is, I worked with probably our nation's top analytics company, and they assume that plants build their own equipment. And in most cases, that is incorrect. Most of the time, equipment comes from uh, original equipment manufacturers or OEMs. And these pieces of equipment are brought into a facility to do a particular uh, operation to a good and keep moving it along until the finished product is done. Uh, I have had the opportunity, I started with my first OEM in engineering at 19, and 36 years later, I am still working with OEMs in the community. Right now, I'm mostly involved with some of the food processing industry. And as you look at that picture, in the right-hand box is a picture of myself, and in the green box is a picture of my buddy, Brian Bender. And this was one of the particular OEMs that I worked for. And by that time, I was probably about 24 years old and I had been shepherded and mentored by a lot of good people to the point where at that young age, I was able to 
design electrical panels, design electrical systems, program the PLC. Uh, I have a mechanical uh, and hydraulic background, so I was able to work with Vickers uh, Hydraulics to help design the, the hydraulics that you actually see on this machine. And so these particular machines, this one went to a uh, major North American OEM, or uh, um, a North American car manufacturer. And so they order equipment from us. And I'm here to tell you two things. One is that the machines keep evolving. So a certain vintage of machine will have certain vulnerabilities or certain quirkinesses to them. And second of all is you're just never done. Um, the last thing I want to tell you is that when you put these machines into plants and with these different vintages, no plant is ever the same, ever. Um, machines are not the same. And so what you might find vulnerable on one piece of equipment might not exist on another. Uh, so we keep evolving them. And then the last story about this picture is if you look in the middle of that beige machine, there is an orange block. And that orange block is, is part of the safeties. And passing through that orange block is a shiny metal ratchet bar. And it's, it's got teeth in it, it's cut, cut out like a, a ratchet. And so what you have to do as kind of a last ditch effort is test all of your safeties under actual load. So Brian and I uh, started to exercise the safeties. And as we closed that uh, moving platen, we dropped the safety dog and the safety dog itself actually worked. But wait for it, um, off the top of that um, safety bar, off, off that ratchet, about a five pound piece of metal sheared off and went through the roof of the building that you, that you are seeing right there. So Brian and I laughed and then we realized how dangerous this was that if it hadn't flown straight up and poked a hole through the roof, that it could have actually killed somebody. So um, each one of these machines are mechanically driven by our uh, programmable controllers. And so therefore, whenever I do safety or security assessments, I go and I talk with the, uh, the customer, I talk with different actors that we're gonna go through here to figure out which of these mechanical systems are the most critical and therefore the, those are the assets and items that we actually need to produce a safety and a security program around. So turns out we could not use that safety bar design because it actually ended up being a weapon to throw something through the top of the roof. Next slide, please. So if you take, have a takeaway from this discussion is that if you target the right mechanical systems or critical processes through automation, then you can actually manipulate mechanical systems and have an effect, be it good or bad, on, on uh, the, the assets and the automation that you're actually controlling. So the mechanical system is the jewels of this whole talk. Next. So to understand a piece of equipment or understand systems that you actually need to defend, you have to look at the total engineering scope. So you're going to end up talking with customers, your process experts, your mechanical and electrical engineers, and then eventually you're going to end up programming it. And that's kind of what we get interested in. Um, each actor has some idea and some golden jewel to, to kind of mine out and understand what's going on with that machine or process. Uh, and you should understand what's critical. So uh, that last machine, I could actually take it down by disabling the lube system and not letting anyone know or overpressuring the, the RAM and actually bending the tie bars. Or in this particular case, I could disable that uh, safety system and send that uh, piece of metal up through the roof. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. So who's involved with the machine design? Ultimately, the customers vote with their wallet. They tell you what kind of product they're trying to make or what process they're trying to do. And so therefore, you actually listen to them and then you get the process experts and the mechanical engineers together to actually build the machine. Mechanical engineers have a distinct advantage in so much as that they work with physical objects, physical properties, chemical reaction, flow versus the logical ob objects that we work with. And 
some of my favorite stories is I have designed hydraulic manifolds before and not very well. But if you put the, the drill holes, uh, you drill the manifold and you put the holes too close together, then you actually can put too much flow through it and it, it creates this harmonic sound that we used to call uh, merry melodies. And the, the issue with the mechanical engineer is if they mess up, uh, they end up normally rebuilding or re-scrapping uh, the piece that they've been working on, whereas us uh, programmers and electrical people can kind of take our mess ups and actually do it. Now, the downside is, is that we don't have a really good formal way of gathering requirements and making sure that we have programmed a system to what these customers and process experts and mechanical engineers want us to. Next. So electrical engineer, again, is gonna tell you fuse sizes, wires, and all that other stuff. And then eventually the automation programmer is gonna take all that information and try to make sure that they have actually programmed the right thing and programmed the thing right. So that is, is difficult to do. And as Jason and I and Tim were talking about for this talk, a lot of times you'll end up with these little anomalies and you, you consider those as typical machine operations when in fact it could actually be an outside influence causing something like a Stuxnet effect. Uh, next slide. So let's look at how the PLC works just from a simple architecture discussion so that it will kind of set up the discussions about the manipulations that we're actually showing in these four demos. Next slide please. So this is a drawing that was started uh, through Rockwell Automation and Cisco Systems in their converged plant-wide Ethernet documents. I was actually part of those teams and, and I have liberally used them here as the backdrop. And what I'm trying to show here is that the genesis of a lot of the data comes from the control system. So it starts from a PLC, it starts from a sensor, it moves it up into some data warehouse, and then that's where most of the folks who are the SANS audiences or typical computer resource people, they start to really understand and put their teeth in it. In our particular side of the world, we understand that uh, this is where the data can start to be corrupted. I remember one time being on a plant floor of a large truck manufacturer and they had written about 300 pages of uh, security, uh, I'm gonna call it architecture and best practices. And as I was on the floor, it, it took me a while, but I figured out how to manipulate the number of trucks that they had made that day. And so I could literally make a truck disappear through the data genesis that was coming from the lower system. So be aware that, that uh, the higher level systems are only as good as the data that they're consuming from the lower levels. Next. So with that said, Jason gave the demo of what happens if you manipulate on the network. Down at the machine level, the PLC will respond to good or bad inputs. It doesn't matter. So there are some drum beating and, and uh, saber, saber rattling at this point in our, in our lives where we're looking at can instruments actually be affected to produce outputs to the controller to cause bad product quality and so on and so forth? The answer is yes, it absolutely can. Uh, likelihoods and probabilities are the things that we argue about, but is it possible? The answer is yes. Next, next slide. So let's look at this simple block diagram of how most uh, programmable logic controls or process automation controllers are actually architected. If we start at the bottom left, there's a block called IO. And so we're going to read inputs and write outputs from based on the logic that we actually solve. In the right-hand side, that's called non-IO. That's where our, our uh, human machine interface, um, HMI traffic comes in through. And at the top is the code execution engine. And that is where we write code and a lot of people kind of spend their time writing and analyzing code and looking for um, vulnerabilities there. But there's something really important in the middle and that's what we call the data table. And you can call it the data warehouse or you can call it memory allocation, whatever you wanna call it. But it's where after the results of the logic has been solved, it sets those variables and then it will end up writing those variable uh, correct states out to the outputs. So let's walk through that real quick. Next slide. So first, in a normal operation, we would read the inputs 
and number two, we'd hit it again. And what we're going to do is we're going to update that data table. So we're going to say, here's our current snapshot of all of our inputs, be it an analog value or be it a digital value, like just a simple switch or push button. Next, number three is we're going to solve that ladder logic or uh, structured text or function block logic. Next. And we're going to put that, those new values back into that data table or that data warehouse. Next, we're going to actually update that IO image table and we're going to write those uh, new output values or hold the last output values to the actual physical devices. Next, please. So what we don't often think about is what would happen if I would just write to the data table and let, let the architectural actually update the logic based on false values or the IO uh, table actually update as false values as well. So go ahead and hit the next one. So we're going to we're going to actually show that now. So we're going to show some demos and um, we've recorded the demo. This these are not live. Um, again, we wanted to make sure if something happened to me, if I got hit by a beer truck or something that uh, Tim and Jason could carry on. But as we look at the demo hardware here, we've got a couple of PLCs. We've got an oven and we've got a temperature transmitter. So let's break this down so we can kind of understand it. So first is the controlling PLC. There's a human machine interface or HMI in which a normal operator would see the status, write and interact with the, the breakers that we're going to point out here in a second. And then the PLC is actually going to execute the code. And we're going to talk a little bit about the code. And it's going to solve the temperature loop uh, to control that oven. And it's also going to control the breakers at the right. So next. So again, kind of rehashing this, the PLC is going to control the breakers at the right. You're going to see in the demo where they flip open and closed. And then the oven in the last demo, we're going to show how we turn that oven off and on. For those of you who have been to ICS networks, that oven should look familiar. Um, to date, we've put through two ovens about 1,200 cookies. So I'm proud of you guys for eating cookies. Um, in this uh, green bubble, we're showing that we have indicator lights so we can show a misinformation between the actual uh, indicator lights and the HMI display. And then last but not least is we have a thermocouple. So I drilled the hole in the back of that oven. I wired that thermocouple to a heart transmitter, which is a, a protocol. And then it goes to that uh, Allen Bradley PLC to be interpreted for the actual temperature. So we continue on. And then last but not least in this uh, demo hardware is I want to show you that PLCs can attack each other just so, and it's harder to understand even if you're monitoring the network. It's going to look like uh, normal traffic unless you have a really good baseline or something that can pull those packets apart. So go ahead and hit the next. So let's look at the logic before we give the demo. On the very right hand side, anything that says the word local in this particular uh, nomenclature means that it's going to be a real physical thing. So on the right hand side in the red, there's a closed pod breaker. So when I energize that either by pushing the push button, pushing the HMI, or in our class, we use a useless box um, switch to actually flip those. Again, it's very straight logic. You wouldn't think anything could really mess with it other than the logic being on the left-hand side. And then down on the right-hand side, there are the lights. So based off of the left-hand side that says real physical inputs, I'm just strictly looking at the inputs and driving the lights from uh, those. So it, it doesn't get a whole lot simpler than that. Next. So what's interesting about this is a lot of times the PLC vendors will give you cross-referencing tools, like where is this output actually used? When I ran the cross-reference um, report from this particular tool, it says, hey, there's only one place where you're actually writing to that output, and it is destructive. Uh, there's uh, in that second to last column, it says destructive. That means I'm actually writing to it, solving the logic and writing to it. And I see the description there. So technically, when I sort of look at this, I think ah, it, it should only be written from one place. Next slide. But what I've actually done is I put some logic in there and I can move entire words over top of output bits and it becomes harder to actually see it. The other thing is that many vendors 
have uh, done things where they say, hey, don't allow these particular bits to be written from OPC or from external. What most vendors have issues with is that they don't stop the writes directly to the outputs themselves. And again, it's by design. So I'm using this as a means in, I'm using it as a way to kind of hide from, from some first level recon. Um, and so let's, let's actually take a look at the demo and how this works. So there's two demos in this first video. Uh, the first one I call it PLC in the middle because most of the demos that you see is somebody gets in between a, uh, a switch and an HMI and they send uh, Python C3PO commands and, and they watch that and they say, okay, that's good. I'm just using the PLC to kind of eat itself. And so I'm going to cause a misleading uh, representation of what the breakers are actually doing and what it's showing on the enunciator panel and become intuitive, obviously, here in a second. And then the second demo is to actually flip the breakers and cause it to uh, not correspond with what's going on. So I will talk through this demo. And Tim, if you could play that, I sure would appreciate it. So controller in the middle. So here is the live running system. I'm going to show you that I'm using VNC to show that HMI in the middle. And what you're gonna see is I'm gonna poke the open button and you're gonna see over at the right, there's this little green indicator moving up and down. So if you watch that on the right hand side, I pushed it open and you'll see those little green indicators change. So again, I can do close and you'll see the green indicator on the breakers go and the red lights happen. So here's the hack. I'm going to use that output bit march to actually start writing over the outputs. And the HMI is still looking at the inputs and I'm using those output indicators because that particular logic is the last one in. And I'm just doing a bit mar march pattern to show you that I am causing confusion between what's actually happened and what an enunciator panel would do. And in most cases, people would um, trust the lights more than the HMI. They would think, no, these are just hardwired. Um, so I'll turn that off and now I'll show you that that can be done from this attack PLC on the left. So now I'm just going to write directly to that output image table and we'll see what happens. So we see that the outputs are flipping on the lights and again, it is an asynchronous write from the PLC on the left to the PLC on the right. I still have full control, but I have a very confusing uh, interpretation of whether do I believe the lights or do I believe the HMI. And again, if I look over at the right hand side on the breakers, they are not flipping. So we'll turn that all off and let it re to resume to its normal situation. So again, we've shown where we can uh, cause the enunciator panels to look different from both a local and from a remote place. And the remote place is much harder to find. Tim, next slide, please. So let's talk about flipping the actual physical breakers themselves. So this is a little bit of fun. I need to set something up here on my end just a second so we can all play in this fun game. All right, Tim, so if you can play that, uh, Tim is much more clever. Before you hit this one, uh, Tim named this music to your ear. So the idea is that you're gonna see me um, write from a very remote place, write to those breakers, and it's going to play a tune, and I want you to try and guess what that tune is. So go ahead, Tim. So this is again the VNC viewer, and you can watch the breakers over the right in the enunciator panel. And then what I'm going to do is have you guess the tune, and then I will give you an ultimate hint here in a second. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. I think you get it. So um, the idea here is that if you saw that the breakers clicking at that thing, you would know that the uh, that the Death Star was near and uh, things, things aren't looking too good. So you can stop that demo if you want, Tim, and we can go to the slides. 
So um, again, to, to kind of recap, we've caused misinformation locally from an enunciator panel to an HMI. We've done that from a remote place as well. And then we've actually operated the breakers from a remote um, PLC and kind of did it to a funny little tune that is known as the Imperial March or um, Darth Vader's theme, whatever you want to call it. So, so now at last, we want to talk about uh, what Jason was alluding to, or actually he did a great job describing, is a PID closed loop controller. But what he did was he manipulated that from a network. So I want to talk you through this oven demonstration and how we can manipulate the sensor to actually do our bidding for us and cause the PID to go and burn the oven up. So on the starting left to right, if you look at this function block, there is an actual temperature PIDE underscore PV or process variable. There is a set point, which is SP. And then on the right hand side, there is a control variable CV that goes to a split range time proportional output, which we could use for heating and cooling. But um, Tim hit, hit the slide once. If we break it down to what you're going to see is there's a thermocouple that's in the oven that's wired up to a heart transmitter. And, that, and heart transmitters and many other transmitters uh, can be configured from near field, which is what you're gonna see the demo that I do and simply because I'm too cheap to buy the next variants, which are, there are Bluetooth variants and then there are flat out wireless variants. So this attack that I'm gonna show could actually have happened from a very long way away. I just happen to be too cheap to buy an expensive heart um, instrument and I just show it using near field with my phone. So what happens is once I read the temperature and if my temperature is equal or above to my set point roughly, then I don't have any output. And so I leave the um, AC off to the oven, hit it again, Tim. Then if I, in uh, Black Hat Skeletor on the right hand side and I recalibrate in step number one and go over there and effect in uh, step number two and I tell it that its range is different, I can make the actual temperature drop which then in the right hand side turns on the output and then step number three is I leave the outlet on and I burn the oven up. So this is what this demo is. So go ahead. So um, yeah, a, a number of bad things are going to happen here. So go ahead and play the demo, Tim. So here, here what we see is we see my phone on the right-hand side, which is going to read that heart temperature. We can see over the right-hand side where the cursor is moving, I'm at 148 degrees. And my oven light, nor is that little lighted um, plug in the bottom on because my set point and my actual are close enough that they're not turning on. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to tell it to go read the configuration out of that heart device that's sitting on the DIN rail. So you're gonna see my hand move close. I'm gonna go read it and I will upload the values from that sensor. And again, this could be Bluetooth, this could be full on ethernet, wireless, whatever. So I'm going to change that upper range and I'm gonna bump it up to make the temperature seem like it's colder than it actually is. And what you're gonna find is I'm gonna put that phone back down on the uh, sensor and I'm going to recalibrate those values and you're gonna watch the actual on the left hand side change to 89 degrees to which then you will see the output of the oven and the output of the, um, of the cord actually turn on and so now we would actually overheat that oven. And Tim, you can stop that demo right now if you want. So in conclusion, you need to understand that the, that the automation systems are really just there to drive the mechanical system. And if you really wanna understand how to compromise a system, understand the mechanics. Monitoring does provide that first line of defense and it's really possible to do it. Um, as you get lower in the architecture, it becomes harder. And your security program should not be, um, should not exclude talking to the actors that include those uh, critical systems, especially mechanical. And then last but not least, doing code reviews on the PLC side is a lifesaver. So uh, I appreciate your time, appreciate your attention.